Welcome to part two of the work on the Gilfillan 711T. I've got the chassis flipped over and I'm doing a time lapse because I've wanted to try one. And also I wanted to show just how much work does go into actually replacing all the components that need to be replaced. And in the case of this radio, it was all the capacitors with one or two micas and every single resistor in this thing was out of tolerance. So I wound up swapping all those out. But uh, it is pretty tedious. But with the hemostat to work things into tight spaces, it uh, really comes together and there's a sense of accomplishment that comes with making it look all nice and neat and getting everything placed where it ought to be. Now there are some pretty significant pauses in some of these sections. I'm having to go between the schematic and the chassis trying to chase out and uh, trace out components. So it may look a little, I had, I had to speed the footage up quite a bit. So very quickly here, I'd like to point out a few things I did. In the time lapse, you'll probably notice me struggle with a few things. Um, just wanted to point out, this guy right here is a .05 uh, that happens to be across the plate of the 6F6 output tube. This one was supposed to be rated at 800 volts on the schematic. I think in a previous video I mentioned that um, Sometimes you'd see a value like that out of a really, really high value. Maybe they got a good deal on parts. That is completely wrong. Ignore ignore that completely. That was stupid on my part. The real reason for seeing capacitors which such, with such high values in the output circuit is purely because the uh, output transformer is in the... It's in the, the primary, but is in the plate circuit of the tube, so it's receiving like 250 volts DC all the time and there's always a chance of an inductive spike coming through and the plate voltage might spike suddenly or maybe the, the tube starts uh, drawing a bunch of current and the plate voltage sags a little bit, which it really shouldn't. The point is, this has to be able to put up with the possibility of a high voltage uh, being developed on the primary winding of that transformer, just like you'd try to protect a digital circuit from interfacing with a relay coil by putting a diode across it to deal with the uh, the the voltage that uh, is induced when the uh, power to the coil is disconnected, that sort of thing. So that that does need to be high voltage rated. Now, 800 is not really a typical voltage rating anymore, so this one is actually rated at, I think, 1.6 kilovolts. I got a good deal on them. However, there is an additional one right here, this Black Beauty, that I untucked. I don't have... A point, this is supposed to be a point zero zero six microfarad rated at somewhere in the same neighborhood as this one. 
I think they, act, uh, they may not actually list what the value is on here. No, they don't. So we're going to rate it the same as this because they both connect to the same point in the plate circuit and this one goes to ground. This one is actually part of the tone control. So I'm going to make sure to give it a good, a good replacement. Uh, the can dome here actually measures perfectly fine, so I left it alone. But every single one of the resistors in here, including this funky divider, those are all well out of tolerance. This guy here is a mica cap, leaving that alone. This one right here may actually be a mica mold. It's a low enough value, and I don't think it's actually listed as a mica. Uh, these guys over here, no big deal. The 100 ohm resistors that are across these guys were originally flexibles, and I damaged the first one. Managed to save the second one. These are supposed to be rated at 1 watt. All of these blue resistors are in here are rated at 1 watt and are 1% tolerance, so they maintain pretty good accuracy. Got that point 0.1 in there. The only thing I have left to do is check the remaining resistors and then put in the new electrolytics. The other thing was this great big ass green 0.25 microfarad guy I found attached to this post right here, which is connected to all the various coils. I looked at the ground spot that it was attached to, and I noticed it looked kind of half-assed. The solder job on it was kind of cold, and it looks like it's just sticking to the outside of the uh, solder being used to ground the braid cable here for the audio path. I checked the schematic, you know, two, three times. There is no mention of an additional 0.25. There's only one 0.25 capacitor in the whole thing, and it's right there. So... I didn't notice any other deviations from factory spec while looking at the circuit versus the schematic, so I'm going to leave this out and see how it does, and if it plays fine, we're going to leave it out, because I get the feeling this was probably just a fix for eliminating some noise or something, probably related to the other components and maybe even the electrolytics dying. Uh, this connection here actually tripped me up for a moment because it looked like this terminal was being directly grounded, and that didn't make any sense since this is literally where the audio signal comes off the volume pot. No, this is for the grid cap on the 6F5 driver tube. This blob of solder right here is actually what holds the uh, wire braid on the outside of that to shield it. So, that was just a little wacky there. But with uh, the majority of this out of the way, I can now slip the antenna wire back through its little hole here. And then I will get on with replacing the more important ones, and then we will fire it up and see if I ruined anything. So from last time I left off, I went through and I replaced every single one of the dog bone resistors in this set. Electrolytics are in, and I also managed to get in the new high voltage uh, guy right here from my Mauser order across the 6F6 output tube. Uh, the only components I have not replaced simply because they're most likely not bad, are the really, really low value uh, domino caps right here. These are below what would usually wind up making them paper, like mica molds. There was one in here that was very suspicious. Let's see, that'll be this guy right here. This is a point oh one, and it's made by solar, but at that size, good chance it's not a mica, so I just opted to replace that. The other ones, though, were just a few picofarads. So we're gonna leave those alone. Set does play all right. Uh, the next thing I need to deal with though, I, well actually no, there's two things I need to deal with. One of them is I could not find a 6U5 iTube. They're pretty hard to find good working ones anymore. Uh, so I opted for a 6E5. Now the two tubes are electrically close enough. You can swap a 6E5 directly into a set that used a 6U5 or a 6G5 uh, and have no problems. However, the 6E5 tube completely closes the eye at about negative 8 volts, I believe, whereas the 6U5 takes negative 22 to completely close. So what that means is when you tune into a strong station with this set, it's going to be hitting the 6E5 with, with you know 22 volts on the grid, and what actually happens is the, the spot on the eye tube that normally closes will actually overdrive and overlap on either side, which uh, has the same effect as putting a brightener on a CRT tube. You're, you're going to, it's going to, it burns twice as bright but half as long, essentially, in that one spot. And uh, 
it'll wear it out faster. So the solution is we need to find which one of these wires to the I-tube goes to the control grid on this thing, and we need to install a voltage divider to cut down the signal. And the, the, six, the I-tubes on these sets are driven using the, uh, the automatic volume control, it's actually automatic gain control, the, the signal that's used to uh, adjust the amplification of each of the stages in the radio. When you get a strong signal in, it pulls the amplification down so that the volume doesn't blast through the set, and when you get a, a low signal coming in, it brings the amplification factor back up and uh, makes sense so that you're not getting hit randomly when you're channel surfing. But that signal is uh, varies in strength directly. It's proportional to the strength of the incoming signal, and so if you hook the I2 up to that, you can see the strength of that signal. But like I said, we need to cut down the signal that this I-tube is going to be getting. The easiest way to do that is with a resistive voltage divider, so um, because the AGC signal is pretty low, we, we don't want to draw any current, so I'll probably need to use resistors in the mega ohm range. One of the examples I saw online was using like 4.7 and 10 mega ohms, because all we, all we need on this tube is a voltage. We don't need any kind of, uh, of current to it whatsoever. To get it to operate correctly, so it should be pretty basic. The other thing I need to deal with, though, is the tuning grommets uh, that have dried up and have gone crusty. You can see they are completely toast. So it's got three screws holding it into the chassis here. I need to get all three of those out. However, getting to this one means I'm going to need to carefully uh, remove this coil. I think this is the yeah, this is the antenna coil. So uh, there's one nut holding it on this side of the chassis here, and uh, it looks like it's attached with a few wires, but there's a decent amount of wiggle room. Oh wait, no, actually, this cap right here is going to be a problem. It's not going to provide a lot of movement. It might prov provide just enough. So I'll need to grab my nut driver here. Okay, found found the wrench I was looking for, driver. These are quarter inch nuts after all, so pretty easy to remove. Make sure we don't lose that. And I did just solder some stuff to this. It's got a lot of a lot of bits attached. Okay. Looks like there was a star nut back there too that I did not see, so I'll keep that. Hmm. I think I should be able to get a screwdriver past that point now. Yes. Whether or not I can. Here we go. Being gentle about this. that one. Now we will have to undo some uh, connections on the bottom of the tuning capacitor. Thankfully this one does not have massive ground braid straps to the tub. Instead it looks like they're just using a few small wires. So I'm also going to have to reorient the chassis here because the dial is actually holding it up right now. So, oh, I need something to grab hold of this hardware. Get in here. Grab these. Now these little guys, depending on who made them, these screws actually have a small brass collar uh, to provide an even depth. When you're crushing it down against the chassis, eventually this will come up against the bottom of the tuning tub and keep it from going anywhere. They're, that way you're not completely mashing the uh, grommets to death. Sometimes they're integral to the washer itself, like they're a little pressed steel piece. That I tend to notice on the later hi-fi sets though. Come on. Just need it. There we go. Now thankfully on this one there's no dial string or anything they have to deal with. The 
tuning knob and the uh, dial and everything all come with the tuning condenser, which makes it much simpler. I didn't get the little brass guy. It looks like the rubber's capturing it. Okay, so, uh, yeah, if we move that, I am going to need to reorient this. Okay, this isn't all that easy to see, but I am going to have to tackle these connections right here on the tuning capacitor. Now these two, as far as I can tell, these are our ground connections. They're uh, going straight to a solder blob on the other side. Although, oh wait, no, my bad. These guys right here, they're actually attached directly to the uh, to the capacitor. Those are our ground ones. These are for the actual uh, capacitor sections. Now there's three of them on the bottom here. The third is just out of sight behind this IF can. So if I undo those, then this whole shebang should uh, come. Well, hmm. I say that, but. Um, all I really need to do is get the tuning grommets out, and since this doesn't have studs, I might be able to just get away with uh, breaking the rubber out of the chassis here, and then stuffing the new ones in. It's uh, not always a bad idea to try the simplest thing first, after all. So I think that's what I'll do. Alright, so after a trip to the hardware store and a little bit of desoldering, I did not wind up completely removing the tuning capacitor. I just undid the three, oops, sorry, these three connections here on the bottom and then just kind of moved it up and out of the way. And I don't know if you can see it, but we've got our new rubber grommets already pressed in, and I put a, preemptively put the little brass inserts in here. And when I went to the hardware store, I actually used the brass inserts to test for fit. These are a standard size conventional uh, rubber grommet, nothing fancy. Just get them in the hardware section. But now all I gotta do is reattach all this, and then uh, I've also been cleaning up the cabinet and a few other things, and we'll flip it over and I'll get to installing the voltage divider for the iTube. Okay, I've already gone ahead and put the rubber grommets and got the tuning capacitor to reattach the chassis. This, however, uh, this is dealing with the tuning eye situation. So if I grab the 6E5 I installed, just about reach here. Okay, you can just barely see, maybe, that the eye is open right now. I've got it off station. We're gonna set that guy there and I'm gonna turn off the overhead so that it's a little easier to view. Assuming that it gets in frame at all. Either way. Okay. So as I said before, when you're swapping a 6U5 set for a 6E5 uh, tube, the, the two tubes don't have the same um, full, cl uh, full close voltage. A 6U5 closes about negative 22 volts. The 6E5 fully closes about negative 8. And I wanted, wanted to do was make sure that this radio will actually generate negative 22 volts on the uh, AVC bus before I go ahead and figure out what resistors I need to make the voltage divider to drive this thing. So what I've got is I've got my, uh, let me turn this back. No, there we go. Can we, can we actually see the voltmeter? Yes. So I'm on the AVC bus right now. I've also got my signal generator connected directly to the antenna coil. So this is going to get the maximum signal through and I've got it attached to 900 kilocycles, I think. We can, uh, Okay, so we're off station. I'm going to turn the attenuation up all the way. Modulation's up enough, and we'll watch the AVC voltage here when I tune onto it. Right about there. All right, so the maximum appears to be about negative 23 volts. You can see when we have a really strong station, it cranks it, and you can see our iTube here is overlapping on the target. We don't want that because it's actually going to burn the uh, the target harder than it normally would. So let's crank that back. So, that's, uh, that's all I really needed to do with that. Shut that off. So the next step, then, is going to be coming in 
right where actually where I've got the red lead. I bring the light down here. Here's the bundle coming off for the eye tube, and this wire right here going to this blue resistor and that terminal board is where the grid connection is. So all I need to do is uh, rig up a voltage divider between the point where I have this red clip attached and ground, and then reattach that lead to the center of it. Um, haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do that. I may just make a bridge out of the two resistors and then attach the wire directly to the center with some solder. Similar to what I did here to get this value. Um, that's, that's fine. Radio companies did actually do stuff like this. I know it looks a little cheesy, but not, they, not, they did that. Right, first a little explanation. Back on the AVC bus, iTube is once again on, and the uh, generator's cranked up. A uh, little difficult to see. Oops. There we go. We look down here, we can see my wonderful voltage divider that I've thrown together temporarily to test values. Uh, I'm using a 3.9 mega ohm on the high end of the voltage divider at the source and a 2.2 mega, ah, mega ohm on the lower end of ground with the grid connection tossed into the middle there. And if we crank this over to the station, or my signal, Fine. Maximum I'm getting right now is around 7. I, at one point I did have 7.5. Yeah, like 7.4. Doesn't completely close the eye, but it gets very, very close. So this, this does work, but um, I think if I lower, or sorry, not lower, increase the value of this uh, resistor just a little bit, go up the next value, I should be able to bring this closer to 8 volts. Actually, it, I think I'll wind up bringing it closer to 9, which technically would cause the tube to overlap a tiny bit. However, the odds of this set ever actually winding up getting a signal this strong is pretty low. You'd need one hell of a long antenna, and you'd have to be right next to a high power station to really get this to work, and odds are this set will have... Well, it might only just have the little stump of an antenna that has coming out of it in use most of the time. And it works pretty well with that anyway. So... I'm half tempted to leave it with these values, but I do think I'll bump this one up just a little bit and it'll increase the sensitivity of the eye a little more because if, for example, we tune over, we, here, actually, if I take off this and we just allow it to tune to a normal radio station, let's see what we get. So there's Como. Now you can see with only about, well, that length of antenna inside there in the coil, we're only getting about 1.2 volts, which does wiggle the eye a little bit, but not much. That's about as much movement as we're going to get out of it on these weak sta or on these stations with that short of an antenna. Yeah. Okay, so I think I will. I will remove the lower resistor briefly, install a higher value, and then come back and see how that works. And if it's pretty good, I think I'll leave it that way. Second time's a charm. I have since replaced a 2.2 meg on the bottom with a 2.7 meg. And let's see how she does. Let's go to a regular station real quick. Yeah, one and a half, 1.6 volts. So you can see we do actually get a little more green on there. So, a little better. Let's go over to our power station here.
All right, max I can squeeze out is about 8.33 volts, and there's still a thin sliver of non-illuminated section, and the eye has pretty well closed. I would call that good. I think we're going to stick with 3.9 and 2.7 for this set. So, there we go. I'll get those cleaned up and installed in a little more professional manner. And uh, then we'll flip the chassis over. And yeah, the last thing to do is to deal with the dial. So after multiple trips to the hardware store to buy some replacement dial bulbs, the first of which didn't go so great because I left them behind. I'll get them back at some point. I now have all four of the dial lights on the dial here hooked up and ready to go. New piece of wire attaching them. Uh, I couldn't find any bulb data on the ones I yanked out. They just say tongue saw 6 to 8 volts. No numbers or anything. Uh, and the only ones I had locally were number 40s. Uh, number 46s are also screw base, but I think these should work all right. And the other thing I did was to replace the original cork gasket around the dial here. This one, I could have left it in there, but the cork has dried out and it was actually shrunk slightly, and it was starting to sag at the top to the point where it was dropping into the field of view of the dial. So while I was at work, I cut a new one out of an appropriate with neoprene. So it's black, so it blends in with the dial a lot better. Uh, getting these tabs unbent to gently remove this glass was very difficult. These are a lot stronger than I anticipated, and I gently was trying to grab them with my hemostat and pull them up without putting any pressure on the glass. Managed to get that, but not something was um, particularly easy. But the glass is nice and stable, and we can, for one thing, shut this window so I don't hear traffic. I want to see how this dial looks. All lit up here. Let me drag the eye tube into view, don't we? There we go. Oh yeah, that's a lot better. I think that is going to wrap it up for this. I do have to put some new feet on the cabinet, but I will get a shot of it all set up in there next. So I'd say that about does it for the set. The feeder on it, the cabinet is well left the way it was because it it's well over seventy years old now. So I'm gonna leave it the way it is and fire up the overhead, and we can take a look at it. Fortunately, the fluorescent is playing havoc with the reception, so it's not going to let you listen to that there. But, set plays good, set looks good, and my only grief with this is the way the iTube is mounted. It doesn't perfectly align with this aperture, and there's really nothing to hold it in there. I've got it all the way, well, I nudged it, but I had it all the way up against the edge of there. And it's just barely coming uh, out of the uh, two prongs of the holder. And maybe the uh, old 6U5 was a lot physically longer tube. I haven't put them side by side to see, but I kind of doubt it. 
Either way, that does it for the Gilfillian 611T. And I can't wait to get this back to the owner. I'm sure he'll enjoy it. And as always, thanks for watching.